Okay, great. Um, so we'll move on to our next speaker, uh, who's Edward Nathan. Um, and he'll be talking about, I think he's here. Yes. yes I great. <laughs> and uh, talking about discovery of asymmetric illumination in GRS 1915 plus 105 via phase resolved spectroscopy of a QPO. So, Ed. Hi. Uh, hi. So, yeah, I'm Ed, just going to the fourth year of my PhD now in Oxford, working with Adam Ingram. Cytopology, I have changed the title of my uh, presentation very slightly, given there was MCMC running when I first submitted the abstract, and the results ended up slightly less significant than, we were, than it was looking like they would turn out. So, But the work is otherwise about the same. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about my work uh, phase solving a QPO in GRS 1915 with simultaneous nice and new star data. This work has been submitted. Uh, it's still awaiting review, though. Uh, so earlier this week, we heard a lot about GRS 1915, what's going to be going on with it. Uh, so for context, and I've just applied this uh, to a figure from Sarah Moss's paper from earlier this year, uh, our observations were like early June 2018. So this is just before the source went into its current X-ray of skill state. Uh, but just kind of the dims ever chi squared at the time. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking at a uh, type C low frequency QPO uh, in, in this data, which is about 2.2 Hertz. Uh, and one of the important things to uh, keep in mind is that we've got two strong harmonics. So I'm always looking at this in kind of a two harmonic kind of way. So we've talked a lot already this week about the different X-ray components. So I'm not gonna go into them too much. One of the things I do want to highlight, though, is that if you consider the kind of reprocessing scattering, otherwise known as the reflection spectrum, uh, locally in the disk rest frame, that's got a lot of like kind of sharp features and a lot of like, and that's kind of the way it is. But the way we see it uh, is kind of a, kind of relativistically uh, smeared, uh, that's kind of this green line in the sketch. Uh, so, and that's going to depend very much on the red shifting, blue shifting from Doppler, and like gravitational shifting that that's going on. Uh, from our point of view. So, and while in my work, I've generally been really agnostic to the models going on, one thing I want to consider though is potentially there's some kind of precession. So this is a model from one particular precession model with a like hot inner flow length theory precession. I'm just using this kind of a nice diagram really. But so let's say something is precessing and it could be at any time preferentially highlighting different parts of the disk. And from our point of view, those parts of the disk have a different, maybe red or blue shift. So at different times, due to that preferential highlighting, uh, we might see the, reflection, the smearing of the reflection spectrum kind of changing, which could cause, for example, the iron line to rock to and from as different, maybe blue bits of like more blue shift and more red shifted changed, or some other kind of spectral effects. So, but to kind of look for this, we want to phase the whole spectrum. We want to see how our spectrum is changing with uh, QPO phase. So the form of the first things we've got to do though is track how the uh, QPO frequency varies throughout our observation because it does slightly. Uh, so uh, what we'll just do is split up the observation to lots of kind of short time segments, try and map out where we think and um, try and use some fitting to find where the QPO is or frequency. We do this independently from nice and new star, but then we kind of just add to just a basic kind of polynomial kind of smoothing fit just so we can kind of nail down where the, which, where the frequency is at different times. Uh, and then we can just correct that, given it does drift by a uh, small amount. So if we consider how the energy spectrum changes this QPO phase, uh, let's say it's just uh, varying something like this. Uh, I just a bit of a kind of schematic. Uh, the first thing we do, we have to use broad energy bands, given we want to make sure we've got enough signal to noise in each uh, kind of any energy band, any channel that we're looking at. So we're looking at, so you can kind of see here immediately the difference in kind of the RMS maybe in different energy bands. And just a reminder, just to fact that we're looking at a two harmonic QPO. So we're looking how this varies as two harmonics. Uh, so if you get the RMS out, or we can look at that, the other thing we want to consider is phases. So we consider a reference band, which is effectively just all the photons, kind of the average uh, spectrum. Uh, and we see how that is varying with time. And then we can begin to compare the phase of each energy channel uh, with the phase of this kind of overall like uh, reference band. So uh, if we have our reference band varying something like that, kind of again, two harmonics, 
because uh, that's what we're looking at. And each energy band is varying similarly, but not the same. Uh, so the first thing you can do is pick out uh, using the power spectrum of each energy band of just the photons in each energy band, uh, the size of the two harmonics. So let's just uh, create a power spectrum or estimate power spectrum and fit that. Uh, we can also pick out the phase uh, difference of, or the phase, sorry, the phase lags uh, between the reference band and each energy band of the two harmonics, uh, comparing the two, uh, the two. And we use that with the cross spectrum, which we heard a bit about yesterday, and also just now from Abby. Uh, we've also got uh, the, the final piece of information we want is the phase difference between the two harmonics in the reference band. And we actually can use the bispectrum, which I believe we're going to hear later uh, from Gavita, who actually was, gave me this idea. Uh, so um, uh, once we get those three pieces of information, we can then kind of reconstruct the waveform in each energy band and uh, do that in, four, in particularly in the Fourier domain. Uh, so the then want to model it. So going back, okay, we've got the three components. Uh, again, I'm not going to labor this point too much. What we're going to focus on is how we allow them to vary, so how we actually model the QPO. Uh, so particularly for the corona, we're using Ents comp, uh, just cut of power law. And for us, that's got kind of three key parameters. For each one, we're going to allow to vary this QPA phase, uh, kind of just gamma here. Uh, and again, two harmonics. So we're allowing this to vary the two harmonic motion. Uh, so rather than just one parameter, we've now got five. We've got the kind of phase average. We've got two amplitudes and two phases. And that can then encapsulate this, in, this varying this kind of two harmonic motion. And we do that for all these three kind of components. We also want to consider the kind of reflection. Uh, so this, this will be based on uh, Zilver CP, but doing our own ray tracing. But this is going to vary somewhat on the illumination of the disk from the corona. So we're going to say that's going to be somewhat proportional to the uh, coronal flux, which we've already got varying. Uh, but we're going to say that we're only going to see a fraction of this uh, from our point of view. Uh, so we're going to have a reflection fraction, which are, we are also going to have as kind of a force component varying this QPO uh, phase in this kind of two harmonic motion. Finally, we're going to say we've got an emissivity profile, which is going to be non-uniform. So it's going to depend on uh, uh, kind of the disk coordinates and also QPO phase. So if we consider that emissivity profile, we're going to break that up somewhat. So first of all, we are not going to consider any like particular geometry. So we're not considering like a lamppost or anything like that. Uh, we're just going to do this kind of uh, more phenomenologically and say, if, let's say the radial dependence is a twice broken power law, which is quite often done. Now uh, we're also going to say we've got kind of disk angle and give you a phase dependence, which is going to go and wrap up in this kind of term uh, with two cos squared terms uh, with kind of uh, our different kind of kind of our harmonics, which can allow for or one or two uh, bright patches to kind of be going around the disk, kind of like this diagram down here. Uh, the important thing to note is if A1 and A2 are both zero, this clearly has no QPO dependence and no kind of disk angle dependence. Uh, if we've only got a radial dependence. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Okay, that is a brief, very brief kind of uh, go through of our model, but how did it that model our spectrum? So if we consider uh, a spectrum, I'm sure a lot of people see plots like this quite often when dealing with X-rays, kind of spectral fitting, uh, you can see some absorption maybe uh, as well, which is thrown in there and we've got a distant reflection in there. But we also allow our model to kind of compute the variations as QPA phase. So we then can find a kind of the Fourier transform spectra. So here I've got uh, basically the first harmonic, we've got that in real and imaginary components, and then the same for the second harmonic. But looking at this directly, we don't get a lot of information straight out of it. We have to look at our parameters. So we run a very long MCMC. Uh, and for each step in the MCMC, we can reconstruct the kind of two harmonic variation of the four parameters that we are allowing it to vary. Uh, and then this kind of creates a probability map uh, of sorts for these. Now I've got some other panels here. I'm not gonna talk about them too much now because I don't have a lot of time. So you can either ask me after or wait for the paper. Uh, but uh, if you think, if you want to consider though uh, this illumination, consider, consider our A1 and our A2 parameters. Remember, if they are both zero, we've got a phase independent, axisymmetric symmetric um, kind of emissivity profile. What we find is that that point is excluded, is outside the uh, two sigma credible interval. Uh, so to that that significance, we can say that actually we do prefer a kind of phase-dependent axis-asymmetric uh, model, which is 
interesting. But particularly interesting is if we consider the reflection spectrum, which again has got this two harmonic motion, uh, two, two harmonic uh, modulation. Uh, here we find that these amplitude parameters are non-zero uh, to at least three sigma, because it's outside the three sigma credible uh, interval. And this really suggests and really disfavors that models of the QPO where the reflection spectrum is merely changing because it's just coupled with the coronal flux are potentially disfavored. And instead, actually, the uh, uh, kind of reflection spectrum is varying slightly differently. So I've just got, I used this as an example earlier, but this is actually our phase dependent component of our model. Uh, it's slowed down by a factor of four. Uh, this is ignoring the distant reflector and ignoring the uh, kind of uh, absorption column, uh, but you can kind of see what's going on just as a diagram. So just to finish off in what I believe is my uh, final minute or so, uh, is if I've timed that right, uh, is that we find a kind of small uh, inner truncation radius. And if you compare that to an ISCO, even for a maximally spinning black hole, that is very small. So is there room for there to be a corona within the kind of truncation radius for this kind of hot inner flow uh, model? Potentially not. But one thing we do find is our, our radial immunity profile is very sharply centrally peaked, which if you compare that to Wilkins and Fabian, uh, their 2012 paper, that could be compatible with some kind of vertically extended corona, which is raised slightly above the accretion disk. So potentially the corona could be some kind of a base of a jet or some other vertically extended kind of structure. So I'm, uh, I think I've got not a lot of time left, so I'm just going to leave my conclusions up uh, for you to read. I'll happily answer questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ed. I completely forgot to warn you about time, but you did a great job of uh, staying on time. So th <laughs> thanks a lot. Uh, I've got a time in front of me, Chris. <laughs> All right. Uh, are there questions? Question in the room. Uh, OK, we'll go to the room first. So it's Barbara DeMarco here. So I noticed that your error, your errors, the errors on the inner radius are really, really small. So I was wondering uh, what it is due to, like you have very good data or like it's just the technique that you use that yeah. makes the error so small. Okay, if I actually skip to here, what we uh, find is that the way we set up our emissivity profile is very dependent on various things. Uh, so it just comes down to this. Now we do have relatively good data, uh, but uh, all this is very highly tied together. Uh, so I think a lot of that comes down to what I was given. Our other parameters, for example, our break indices are based upon down to kind of the inner radius and that also affects the kind of Q1, Q2. So I think it's just kind of the interplay between all of those in our MC, MC uh, does kind of affect that. Uh, but yeah, so it, they are very small errors. Uh, we admit that uh, that's just the way, that's what's come out. Uh, so yeah. Okay, one more question, uh, Greg. Yes, one question. You're muted, Greg. Greg, sorry, can't hear you. Is this better now? Yeah, yeah. better. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, a, a, this week we've heard a lot of people advocating for the lamppost models. And I'm trying to understand how is it that we're getting this sort of bifurcation? Basically, you're claiming that there's very little room for a vertical extension, while others are claiming that they're seeing this. You know, What do you think the resolution to this is? Uh, so, what I'm th what I'm saying, uh, I'm not sure if you just misspoke with what you were thinking of. I'm th I thought if I just go to uh, here, uh, so I'm actually saying that potentially it is a vertical, vertical extension because it's there's maybe not enough room uh, within the kind of the within the inner truncation radius. Uh, so actually, I'm kind of saying that it potentially is that kind of there is potentially some vertical extension, uh, but which it would be potentially compatible with the lamppost model, potentially. Okay, thanks, Ed. Very nice talk. There is uh, one question in the room. If oh, is... sorry. Okay, one more question. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. For the conclusion, I'd like to ask a very naive question. So uh, yeah. I'm very impressed you, you found evidence that uh, there is a lighthouse at the center of the disk, right? That illuminates the, 
the desk, but then I'm a little lost. When you say precession, you mean precession of what? Uh, I'm talking about just precession of something, of just something illuminating. So kind of the corona, given we're considering the coronal, uh, the coronal kind of spectrum uh, is potentially whatever's causing that. Uh, we're like, however, like I said, we've been trying to be really agnostic about what this actually is, given I'm sure you're aware there are various different kind of coronal models. Uh, so I, I'm really saying, I'm not going to say it is one particular model. All I'm saying is that whatever happens to be causing potentially this kind of coronal illumination of the disk, something that is potentially processing. Okay, uh, let's think that again. <laughs> 